delighted to introduce today's lecturer, renowned, internationally renowned <laughs> neuroethologist, <laughs> Rainer Gillette from the Department of Molecular and Integrated Physiology and the Neuroscience Program. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that uh, sterling introduction. Um, it was interesting for me to be invited to uh, give a lecture in the class, and uh, I thought I would uh, lecture on a topic that uh, I've really been interested in, uh, which is uh, sociality and cognition. And the question is, uh, is uh, uh, what part does, what part do circadian rhythms play in the evolution? of sociality and cognition. And uh, the punchline is, which we'll come to, and hopefully before two hours are completely up, is that uh, a switch from a nocturnal to a diurnal activity favors the evolution of both sociality and cognition. So we're gonna talk about that. And first we're gonna talk about, uh, I thought it would be useful, I thought it would be useful just to talk about some of the characteristics of diurnal and nocturnal animals. And uh, uh, they have certain adaptations to day life or night life, right? So for instance, in the, in the realm of vision, what's the difference between nocturnal and diurnal animals? I'm not doing all the work here. <laughs> Good, good. Nocturnal animals are really pretty sensitive to, uh, to what? Red light and... Uh-huh, they're mostly rods, right. Right, right. and uh, the diurnal animals, their, their retinas are, are, are basically full of cones, like squirrels have uh, just a billion cones in their eyes. They have much more acute vision than ourselves. And uh, they're, they have terrific color vision. Of course, many, many animals do not have color vision at all. They just uh, see things in sh various shades of gray. The animal with the uh, greatest color vision that anybody knows about is the stomatopod. How many people know what a stomatopod is? The mantis shrimp. All of you? <laughs> the mantis shrimp is an animal that gets to be about this big. If you go to Europe, you'll have it served with spaghetti, right? And uh, they're, they're these awesome shrimp, and they're, they have these, these, these strikers, these legs that are just, just serrated and they're cutting edges, and they sit there and they are capable of smashing a bottle, the big ones, when they strike and uh, they live on the reef. And uh, those of you who have spent any kind of time on a reef know that the visual world is really complex. It's like walking around in front of the water tower during, uh, during uh, 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 a very busy time of day. And the colors in the shallow waters next to the reef are many and varied. These animals are, are very intelligent. They know where they live. They, they home. They have a good cognitive map of their surroundings. They learn to recognize other individuals and they have this terrific color vision. Of course, they can be very colorful themselves. And uh, so you can recognize individuals on the basis not only of their form, but their color patterns. So they're probably one of the most amazing uh, uh, genera of arthropods. So uh, we have uh, animals that see in the dark tend to have big, this is an easy one. Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> right, right. And uh, uh, they collect a lot of light and their, uh, re their photoreceptors tend to have very large fields themselves. They tend to be very large and they can collect a lot of light and, and tell the animal that yes, here's something over here, possibly a bat is coming to kill me or uh, uh, I can see something by the light of the moon and this is going to help out. Um, what about hearing? What are the differences in uh, audition? 
auditory capacities in animals that uh, are diurnally active versus those that are nocturnally animal, uh, active. How, what about predators? What about predators? What about directional hearing? Well, what about owls? Owls have these big eyes and they just sit around and some of them, especially like the barn owls that's sitting around here, have uh, their feathers are organized so that they actually amplify the sound. It's like a hearing trumpet. Their face is like a hearing trumpet. It amplifies the sound and they sit there and they can hear the tiny rustle, the pitter patter of an eensy beensy mouse in the bushes and they can actually home in on that directionally. It's, they're just absolutely exquisite in their auditory abilities. And this is their adaptation for hunting in very dim light. Um, directional hearing is very important in many animals, of course. Uh, what are the other senses that uh, might be important and, and change between the day and the night active animals? Gustatory. Gustatory, Pace. good. <clears throat> How would, how would you expect that to differ? Diurnal animals would have maybe a more uh, developed sense of taste because they associate taste with different uh, colors, like fruits, for example. That's interesting, a different associative ability. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. That's very, that's good, that's good. Of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, nocturnal animals have very highly developed senses of smell. Yeah and uh, uh, just so that they can uh, dig out the earthworms or things like that. Like the, the, you all, the first thing that's popping into your mind is probably the spiny echidna, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which just has a terrific sense of smell and goes around just, just going, ooh, there's one, and digs it out. All right, you remember what the spiny echidna is? It's that monotreme, looks like a little bird, this little spiny guy, but it, uh, it's a mammal, and it lays eggs and suckles its young. So let's see, what else, uh, what other senses do we have? What are, what are some specific senses that are highly evolved in animals that live in the dark? Doesn't have to be completely diurnal, but animals like, uh, oh, let's say, uh, electric fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gave it away. <laughs> Electric fish that live in the very turbid waters of the Orinoco and the Amazon River, and uh, uh, perhaps and, and and the Nile, different species, different different uh, families of electric fish that have evolved an electric sense that actually a lot and very they have very tiny eyes. They're not much good for use for telling whether it's night or day, but they're alive with their electric sense. They can actually having photoreceptors, electroreceptors all over, the, all over the lateral parts of their bodies and their faces and the ability to generate an electric field and detect distortions in it are actually able to image their surroundings in a way that you and I can only imagine. Suppose you could do that and avoid walking into a chair or, 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 or detect a, a tiny water flea down here, down towards your tail and suddenly flip around, grab it up. Oh, if we could only do that. <laughs> uh, so the electric sense, the electric sense uh, is a very ancient, ancient sense. And uh, the best evidence is that uh, we all had it at one time. Our ancestors, our, our, our marine ancestors all had an electric sense, but most of them lost it. The, most of the teleost fish all lost it. There was a huge part of the brain that was evolved to the very complicated computations that served this electric sense. And as they lost it, as they became, uh, as they enter, entered the, the necton, as they began swimming around, uh, and developed much better eyes. They didn't need the electric sense. If you don't use it, you lose it. And they lost that whole part of the brain. They you'd think they could have put it together to use that machinery, that circuitry for some other complicated computations, but it's lost. And 
those fish that we were just talking about, the ones in the Amazon, the electric fish in the Amazon, the clownfish, the uh, 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 gymnotiformis, 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 living in uh, the African rivers, completely re-evolved it de novo. They re-evolved it from vibration receptors, the progenitors, the uh, uh, evolutionary progenitors of our own inner ears, right? They re-evolved it. They just altered things a little bit, fiddled with the electrical characteristics, and in particular, the peripheral structure surrounding the, photo re the electroreceptors uh, so that they became very, very sensitive. So, sensory. Sensory abilities can differ widely between nocturnal and diurnal spe species. So I don't know how related this is to nocturnal and diurnal species. Um, one thing I've wondered about for a long time is I know that there was, there's conjecture about birds localizing to um, certain areas using magnetic fields. How validated is that? Awesome. I, I had completely forgotten about magnetic fields. It's getting uh, more and more support. And uh, people are homing in on the actual molecules. I think they're, they're cryptochromes. Cryptochromes that also have a function in circadian rhythms that are part of the uh, uh, transducers for the magnetic sense, for the ability of an animal to orient itself within a magnetic field and use it for homing or for migrations. It's Great. intriguing that basically they, still, they haven't been entirely messed up by all the wires that we put out there. Because you assume that basically that would overwhelm all of the natural, you know, or at least a huge chunk of the natural fields. I think you may have a very valid point there. It would be interesting to uh, learn something more about that. Because uh, a lot of birds, uh, a lot of birds use magnetic sense in migration, not just for homing, but for along their migration routes. They fly the route, they learn it, they come back and uh, there's a few, few thousand more power lines up. What does that do for them? Good question, good question. The magnetic sense, that's a great one. What about uh, animals that, uh, what are, do we have any other senses? Have we run out of senses yet? What? Touch. What? Touch. touch. Appropriate touch, proprioception. Touch. <laughs> any ideas? Any ideas? Better in nocturnal animals? You would think it might be better. The first thing that occurs to me is the star nosed mole. Have you ever seen this ridiculous animal? The picture of this ridiculous animal it has this big fleshy star shaped thing on its nose, and it's extremely, extraordinarily sensitive to touch. And uh, it comes out and, and uh, or, or it goes through its little burrows, and uh, uh, who knows what it's good for. We'll have to look that up. That was a great one. So are moles nocturnal or diurnal? I would guess they're... I'm not sure either. <laughs> I'm not sure, or are they, uh, what's, what's the word, cathemeral? Cathemeral, any, any other senses? Have we run out of senses? Since it's a circadian class, would you consider a chrono sense, a sense of time? Like, I, if you tell me to wait five minutes, I can guess approximately what, how long it takes for five minutes to pass. Oh, I think you've hit on a whole unexplored area of research. <laughs> I think I would, I would work on that. There's probably wheelbarrows full of money available for we, that. We that's, a great, so, right? that's a great, <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, well, let's see. Um, let's see, perhaps we've beaten this to death. What about this? It was what was really important in our own recent evolution within the last 10,000 years is the domestication of animals and plants. And uh, with regard to all the animals that we've domesticated, are they diurnal or nocturnal? What are some animals? What is it? Oh, doggies. <laughs> uh, primarily nocturnal. You think they're primarily nocturnal? I think a lot of dogs' ancestors were coyotes and whatnot. Or were they, let's see, wolves and uh, the coyotes and most of the canids? They're, they're, kind of, they're, they're kind of crepuscular. And actually, I guess uh, they did operate a lot at night. And, uh, but living with us, for the most part, they've probably come around 
to an activity pattern in the daytime. Cats are another for sure, right? Crepuscular and, and nocturnal, they're always out killing birds in the middle of the night, right? And then leaving, leaving a little gift for you on your doormat. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but they're, they're there when you want to pick them up and play with them or, 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 or whatever, right? So that's a good one. But uh, what about horses? Diurnal, right? But the really super useful one, dogs were super useful too, right? Uh, dogs were apparently first domesticated by uh, the, uh, the, the hunter-gatherers about 25,000 years ago. And uh, they find burials of, uh, of what they called, uh, what was the word? Incipient dogs. Incipient dogs. These are wolves that are evolving towards doghood. They're hanging out with people and they're starting to acquire neotenic baby-like features, right? Their muzzles get shorter, their uh, anatomy changes, and with this usually comes a more puppy-like behavior, which is good, you know, they don't bite your hand off immediately. And they use them apparently to help them drag the, uh, uh, the, the, the mastodon meat back to camp. They would, make, they would make sledges out of the ribs of the mastodon, pile meat on it, and hook it up to the dogs. And they found a burial. They found a burial of the, uh, the, well, these incipient dogs, three dogs at one point, and one of them had a mammoth bone in its mouth. Was that cute? <laughs> and then the Ice Age, the Ice Age came and screwed everything up. And everybody quit doing what they were. They had to do other things. They stopped keeping dogs, or incipient dogs. And they disappeared. They went extinct. And it was only until about another 13,000 years that they began uh, co-evolving together again. And we have our modern dogs from uh, a similar association. So probably happened several times at different places in the world. So, cool. Um, where were we? Ah, so dogs, horses, cats, uh, cattle, cattle, mostly diurnal. Uh, very, very useful, uh, no, no problems there. What are some other animals? Uh, llamas, right? The llamas of, of uh, Peru and uh, Ecuador and, and uh, Chile. Uh, vicuñas, alpacas. Uh, all the other camels, right? The dromedary, the Bactrian camel, right? All pretty well diurnal, very well fitted to domestication and uh, uh, easy to work with. Um, chickens? Chickens. Chickens. Who said chickens? Good one. Right. The, the jungle fowl, the Asian jungle fowl, uh, became our chicken. Uh, clearly, a, a a diurnal animal that was, wasn't very good at flying at all. <laughs> so it's easy to corral them. Good one, good one. Yeah, pigs How about, too, yeah. The what? Pigs. Pigs. From, from boars or whatever. Right, 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 right. So uh, it wasn't just that they were easy to catch while they were sleeping. You had to chase them down and uh, tie them up and keep them and uh, uh, grow to love them. <laughs> and, and live with them and develop uh, strains of influenza that went back and forth, right? So. <laughs> Any others? Elephants. Elephants. Oh, that's a good one. Elephant. The elephant. Diurnal or nocturnal? Both, right? Cathemeral. Cathemeral. Through the day. These guys eat so much all the time that they sleep and have activity periods that extend through the night and the day. Okay, good, good one. What are some other catemeral animals? Dolphins. Dolphins, good one. Right, oh, we free, completely forgot about the, the uh, echolocation senses of nocturnal animals like the bats, right? They're the nearest relatives of the primates. The bats, beautiful, beautiful. Echolocation and bats and in certain birds, in certain of the swifts, you know those uh, uh, bull bats you see flying around here in the summer, the big swifts, uh, they have relatives in Indonesia which themselves are pretty good echolocators. You can hear them shouting in the summer here 
Uh, they're probably mostly social signals, but uh, apparently there are several species that have evolved to use that sense very effectively and economically. Good. Um, any other any other animals? How about really big animals? Elephants, which were catemeral, because they're eating all the time. What about other really big animals? We talked about camels, pretty darn big. Um, whales. 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 You know, I don't. I, I looked around. I don't know if there's very much known about uh, whales, but you see them. We see we see lots of pictures on YouTube of them sleeping in the daytime, and they probably do it at night too. So that, but they're for the most part catemeral. Um, what what else? Lions, catemeral. They hunt both at day and the night. You're never safe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anything else? Really big animals. What about the giant squid? The giant squid. It, well, it lives at such great depths. I guess there's a question as to is it getting many light cues that just are not coming from the luminescent animals that it lives around and probably preys upon. Yeah, that's a good one. But most squid, most squid, uh, I think, I think, uh, they're catemeral. Uh, in, in my experience, you know, you catch them at night. The boats go out at night. They put the lights out. They attract the squid. They net them up. And uh, you go, you can stand on the pier and shine a light down in the water. You see a formation of squid going by. You can see that night or day. Uh, they must sleep sometime. I don't know. That's, a, that's another very, very good question that nobody's looking at too much. Octopus? Different octopus. Uh, octopus are very visual animals. They have super, super eyes. They uh, go out on the reef during the day. They go out on the reef during the night. They don't need their eyes so much because they have the ability to, uh, they have this uh, tactile, ex exquisite tactile sense. Thank you, Raj. Exquisite tactile sense. They're probably able to recognize where they are just through uh, the geography that they encounter and find their way home. They also home. Um, crepuscular animals. Foxes. Um, nocturnal. nocturnal and crepuscular. Uh, what about what about uh, what about those animals that have co-evolved with us and uh, live around us, uh, often in a very obligate way, and uh, uh, eat our grain supplies and, and, and steal the cheese out of our traps? Nocturnal. Okay. Nocturnal. Rats, mice, the little rats, if they came out in the daytime, we could get them right away, right? Just blast them away. But no, they're sneaking around. He's asleep now. Um, Mice, what about, uh, what about those little blood-sucking uh, guys? How about bed bugs? Oh, bed bugs, bed bugs, bed bugs. Um, how about, uh, uh, let's see, what's that? I don't know, the little assassin bug. The, what's, the, what's, what's the one that gave Chagas disease to Darwin? Uh, the, I can't think of it. It's right, now. right, right. Yeah, another, another, another relative of the bed bug but very, very distant, more related to the assassin bug that we see around, the wheelie bug we see around here in the summer. A big guy like this, has a big proboscis like this. You throw it a cricket, it goes, ah! <laughs> dead like that. You don't want to pick this guy up the wrong way. <laughs> so, um, um, mosquitoes, Mostly crepuscular, although they can they can come out. Different species can come out during the day. There are many different species. Uh, mostly malaria seems to be transmitted at, at the nighttime, though, and, and yellow jack and things like that. Um, so these animals that take advantage of us mostly seem to do it when we're really susceptible. Good idea. Um, how about, this is, a, this is a great one, bird migration, right? Why migrate in the day? Why migrate in the night? Yes. 
day would be, if you have good vision, you can see better where you're going. Right. But night would be less chance of prey, maybe catching up. Good one. Yes. Right. Uh, you're avoiding predation. Most animals, are, a lot of animals are nocturnal because there's such predation uh, pressure. Plus, many of them are able to tell what direction they're going and where they are through looking at the constellation, through the orientation of the Milky Way, and, and, and putting that, and, uh, correlating that with the time of year. This is, this is very well known for many, many birds. So nocturnal animals, uh, the air is quieter. If they get up and fly, and they're really good fast flyers, they can just go straight for thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, diurnal, diurnally, uh, you know, storks, storks in Denmark and England and Holland, places like that in Northern Europe, they migrate down to Africa. The shortest way to Africa is a straight line across the Mediterranean. But storks are lazy. They hate to flap their wings. What they like to do is wait for a nice, warm day with puffy clouds when there's lots of thermals, rising air, and they'll fly along, they'll hit one of those. They may have a special sense. There is a special organ that birds have that, birds have that uh, may be able to detect small changes in barometric pressure, just like an altimeter that they can use to tell when they're in rising air, besides that, that uh, drop in the, 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 the intestines that you feel when you hit, hit something like, like that. And they can tell this, and they can tell when they're in rising air, they have a sense, like the vultures you see around here. They're just amazing birds. Hate to flap, always looking for rising air. And the storks instead take this long, circuitous route, uh, more than a thousand miles longer than they would need to, going through Turkey and down through Saudi Arabia and Yemen into Africa. Okay, so different strokes for different birds. This is my favorite. It's not quite so related, but octopus. Octopus. I gave a lecture a while ago on. Uh, uh, on mollusks and uh, the great lack of uh, uh, a really higher cognitive level and sociality which is associated with cognitive ability in mollusks and in particularly in particularly the cephalopods which we all like to see on the nature program and say oh the octopus is so smart he can open a jar and uh, but really when you look at when you look at the the octopuses they're uh, they're, they're just these terrible cannibals. They're, 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 they act like lunatics. Around, uh, uh, they, they do have fairly good abilities to map things and, and learn to what things taste like and what things look like. But uh, they're, uh, as far as sociality, you put two octopus together and they might immediately mate if that's going to work out. But if you keep them together, one gets eaten. Diving in the Mediterranean, I found that one out of 10 octopuses that I observed was dragging along a dead friend. It's like the octopus named Dave. <laughs> so, but this just came, this hot off, the, hot off the wires. The greater Pacific striped octopus off the Pacific coast of Nicaragua and Guatemala turns out to live in groups and pairs <coughs> will occupy the same lair. Pairs and lairs. <laughs> pairs and lairs. And they're social and they're cooperating. Are they cooperating to brood? We don't know. This was just, this was just off the wires. Evidently, uh, a Nicaraguan reported this back in the early 90s but uh, nobody would believe it because they say, oh, this is impossible. Oct we know female octopus, they lay eggs and then they, they take care of them, they stop eating, and they die. But you're telling us this octopus can lay multiple clutches of eggs? That's ridiculous. Oh, we will not publish this paper. So it took, it took uh, another 20 years for people to get together and <laughs> investigate this. And finally, it's coming out. The, uh, 
a Pacific striped octopus. Look at the patterns on this guy. Diurnal or nocturnal? I would say anybody colored like that is probably pretty diurnal. Maybe nocturnal, but they're doing most of their socializing, I'll bet, uh, during the day. Watch this. This is a male displaying for a female in that little uh, tube there. Look, this is typical of mate guarding in squid. One side turns pattern and he shows it to the female and uh, the other side stays a neutral color or a threat color for the males that may be watching. And he's just flashing it on and off, on and off, on and off. Look at me, look at me. <laughs> totally interesting. What's going to come out of this? This is exciting. I used to, I, used to, I actually maddened people by, by saying that uh, uh, really the octopus had reached, seemed to reach sort of a dead end. Most of the cephalopods were uh, not as interesting as uh, uh, they tell us on the Nature Channel, but maybe they're going to be. So, Evolution of sociality and cognition are intertwined. If you take a social animal, if you take a, a social animal, you usually find higher cognitive abilities. What's cognition? I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay focused. <laughs> What's cognition? <coughs> we talk about it all the time. The ability to process what you sense and make good decisions about it. Well, I like that. Good. Good. So you make decisions on the basis of what? What do you sense? You mean based on what or for what? Well, decision. Information, right? Right. Okay. How do you even know what information is? Well, we, we talk about cognitive ability all the time. People give, come and give these long seminars about cognitive, cognitive, this is very cognitive, that's very cognitive. What is cognition? If we're going to talk about cognition, let's define it. What's intelligence? We know, we, we're embarrassed, we talk about intelligence all the time, but when somebody asks us, to, say, well, what's intelligence? It's, oh, it's a, oh, we measure it on tests. <laughs> What's cognition? Well, cognition, actually, if you ask people, you'll get almost as many different an answers as, you, as the number of people that you ask. And, but most people like to think that it um, involves learning. Uh, the best, the, best um, the ability to learn and, and make discriminations, the best definition that I've seen, that I like the best, which seems to hold out uh, a possibility of being at least semi-quantifiable, is that uh, cognition is the goal-directed use of knowledge. Does that work for you? Try it out. The goal-directed use of knowledge, that brings in learning, that brings in instinct, and uh, everything else uh, that we need, I think. I could be wrong, I'm often wrong. So, next question. What is sociality? Oh, Dr. Gillette, this is so trivial. Are you wasting our time? I mean, it's sociality, that's getting together, you know, in sociality. What is sociality? What is sociality? <laughs> what does a sociobiologist say sociality is? It's um, a, a, a good sociobiologist, like Robert Trivers, would tell us that sociality is uh, animals interacting to increase their reproductive fitness through manipulating the other's behavior. Okay? A lot of people hate this, but it works pretty well, and you can model it very nicely. Let's look into uh, sociality. Grouping. Why do animals form groups? Why get together in a group? Why not just be a solitary, solitary person 
to reduce the chances of being preyed upon? Like it. Yes. Right. So the bigger the group you're in, the less chance that he's going to take you. Right? Any other reasons? To mate? Yeah. Exactly. Simple access to mates. Access to resources like food is easier. You get information from watching the other animals. And if you learn what they look like when you find food, you can go over and share it. <laughs> right? And then, uh, of course, you can make deals. If you can make deals and you start playing the tit for tat game, then uh, perhaps everybody can get well and will form an economy that eventually uh, in humans has resulted in the, the, the complex uh, organization of worldwide trade. Like that. What are the disadvantages? <laughs> More competition for your resources. Though. Yeah, right. If the, if the resources get low, boy, you're, you're, then you're, you're going to do the cannibalism thing. Very likely. Disease, parasites. So there are trade-offs. There's pluses and minuses. This is my favorite social animal. This animal has a very highly developed social organization. This is the vampire bat. Oh, what a beauty. You know what the vampire bats do? They wait until nightfall, they fly out, they find a burrow, they find a horse, they find, uh, uh, we've, we've killed all the uh, native ungulates down in South America, the, the, big, uh, the big animals they used to prey on, but fortunately we introduced cattle. And so they go out, they'll land on, a, on the cattle and, and bite a hole in them. They secrete an anticoagulant so the blood keeps flowing. They just lap it up, lap it up, lap it up. And, and uh, because flight is so expensive that immediately that uh, fluid arrives in their stomach and enters the bloodstream, they start urinating. Because to fly, they have to let, jump off the ground and uh, be able to uh, provide enough lift and thrust to carry them out. So if they can't, uh, uh, sometimes you can see videos of bats that have just eaten too much. They're just sort of flopping around. <laughs> but uh, you know, some bats, some bats don't make it. Some bats go out. They, they have to have a blood meal every 72 hours. Blood is thin soup. Every 72 hours, or they starve to death. So what's happening with these bats in this uh, precarious economy is that they form relationships and they're stable relationships and they're not necessarily between kin, between related bats. They can just be between a couple of bats that have gotten friendly and, and uh, roost together. And if one bat comes in and has not made a meal, she, this is mostly the female bats that are uh, really social like this, they get together and she begs and uh, she licks the other's face, and if the other has a good blood meal and she's willing to give it out, then she will regurgitate enough blood to keep this other bat going for another 16, 18 hours and have another go at it. If she refuses, if this other bat lives, then it, if they meet again, it is very likely that the, first, the, the bat who was, did not receive a meal that time will not give another bat. This is a reciprocal partnership between these animals. They recognize each other, they have friendships that last up to 25 years. And so forth. You know the tit for tat game, right? It's uh, I do you a favor, you do me a favor, right? If we get together, if we're cooperating on something, we can get together, and if we cooperate, we might make a small profit, each of us. If we get together and you shoot out the lights, grab the money off the card table, and jump out the window, if you defect like that, then you're the winner. But if I catch you, if I catch you again, I can exact revenge. Uh, when you play this game, when you play this game, the best, the best strategy for winning and losing is uh, do unto others as they, have, as they have done unto you. Isn't that sweet? 
but then do to them like they did last time. Okay? And that's the winning strategy. But successful tit for tatters are also very forgiving. You know, they'll forgive. Uh, and you may be able to form some kind of partnership. You know, you go out on the reef. This is a beautiful place to see every kind of behavior and every kind of behavioral partnership. There's lots of mutualistic partnerships that work like this, but some of them t sometimes turn into the little cleaner shrimp or fish will set up a station and, and uh, uh, perhaps you've seen this on the Nature Channel or even out on the reef. They'll set up a station and uh, wave their little claws or something and a big grouper will come over and sit there while they clean it off. And once in a while, once in a while, that little fish or shrimp will just go in and take a big hunk of gill. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a big prize, but that animal will probably not come back to that cleaning station for a long time when that happens. This happens sometimes. So, sociality and cognition. This is from a lecture I gave uh, at a meeting last spring, and I discussed uh, I discussed the uh, cognitive evolution in mollusks. I work on a mollusk. I work on this mollusk. It's a big predatory sea slug from California. It's uh, an opportunist. It, eat, it, will eat, it will try to eat just about anything. It's, uh, uh, however, it has very few predators except uh, cannibal species of its own kind because when it's annoyed, it secretes sulfuric acid from the skin. The skin pH drops from ambient, about 8, down to about 1.5. Nobody wants to eat that. That's like salad dressing that have really, really gone off, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, my point was that this is a nervous system. It's a very simple, very simple nervous system. Some very simple aspects, like the, the neurons are gigantic. Instead of have, it's a giant animal. You know, most mollusks, they're about a half a centimeter, really. Most molluscan species, maybe half a centimeter in, in size. This guy can get very big. Uh, but big mollusks, big, uh, big sea slugs like this, instead of getting a lot more neurons to control the greater periphery of their body, they just use the neurons that they have and make them gigantic so they can innervate more. It's crazy why they did that. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's an extremely simple animal. Uh, those of you who have taken my neurothology course have seen, have seen this movie again. Do you, do you want to watch a video or would you rather hear me make some dry descriptions? <laughs> okay, this is uh, the cognitive level at which this animal lives. This is this one super goal-directed use of knowledge. This is the Spanish shawl, a beautiful little nudibranch. Her colors are warning coloration. But he can't see that. Instead, he gets stung in the mouth when he bites her. She starts doing her little flamenco dance. She's called the Spanish shawl for that. And, and he's trying to get rid of those little serrata with all the stinging things. He does this stereotypic avoidance turn. We know the neural circuitry for this. Avoidance turn, puts his foot down. She's dancing like crazy, but uh, they usually live in a strong current, so she would be far away by this time. And he puts his foot down and slugs off at top speed. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty minutes later, we put them back together. It's almost thirty minutes, isn't it? Okay, this is a very highly selective odor learning. It recognizes the Spanish shawl. It recognizes the Spanish shawl as uh, something dangerous, and it will continue to eat other things. Its feeding threshold, which we can actually measure pretty well, doesn't change significantly. It's really, it's really getting off on the odor of this animal. It has warning coloration, but uh, that purple and orange, the bright purple and orange, typical of warning coloration, but uh, pleurobranchia can't see, uh, but it must have a warning odor. One odor that's initially neutral, but once you associate it with a negative experience, it remembers, oh, 
I am not going back in that restaurant where I got food poisoning. Like that, right? The old Garcia conditioning trick. So, this animal is remarkably simple. It's a large animal, it has a diminutive nervous system, only a few tens of thousands of cells in it, the neurons, it's, it's pretty easy to work out the circuitry. Uh, you saw it's one cognitive trick, right? It can learn what's good and what's bad. And it can make an approach avoidance decision, your basic decision. Almost everything we make is spun on approach and avoidance of, of salient stimuli in the environment, no? Uh, so it can do that. It's not sociable at all. It's only aspects of sociality are copulation and cannibalism. And that's it, right? And uh, if they meet a smaller animal, they'll try and eat it. The smaller animal can recognize the big one with some chemical signal and try to get out of there. If two animals meet that are about the same size, they may ignore each other and, unless one's super hungry, or they may mate. It is a reciprocal hermaphrodite, almost a perfect reciprocal hermaphrodite. There's no haggling about who's going to be the male or the female this time. It's perfectly reciprocal. That means there's no competition for the role. In many cases, reciprocal hermaphrodites will vie for one role or the other, being a male or the female, depending on the resources available to them and the environment. Right? It's like the, uh, uh, well, I won't, I won't go into it, but uh, it doesn't take care of the offspring. It goes and lays the eggs. The eggs hatch, go into the plankton, and uh, they never see mom and dad again. Uh, the brain of the animal does not care how much glucose is in the blood. You and I care a lot, right? Too much glucose in the blood and we just have to lie down and take a nap. It doesn't care, it doesn't monitor, like we do, the amount of fat in the body by looking at the levels of circulating leptin hormone. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't care what kinds of hormones are in the blood that are related to digestive products. Uh, it only seems to care if its gut is full or empty. And if it's full, it stops eating because there's no percentage in eating anymore if you're already full. It's a physiological challenge anyway. When we eat a meal, it's a huge, we spend more energy in eating and digesting our meals than we do in practically any other aspect of our lives. The, uh, the, the intestine is, is a marvelously compl complex uh, quasi-intelligent organ that uh, uh, burns a lot of energy. Um, uh, so it only cares if its gut is empty or full. Its whole strategy is to, its life strategy is to eat as much as it can, get as big as it can, and turn those resources into eggs. And it doesn't look like the brain is in touch with how big it is, but the reproductive system is the most likely set of organs that is monitoring how much glycogen is in the mantle. And when the animal is big enough and old enough, it takes control of the hormonal control of the brain and tells it, stop all this other stuff. We're going to lay some eggs. And then it goes over and lays this really pretty little curtain of eggs uh, on a rock or something. They're not aggressive, besides simple predation. OK, they're not aggressive. They eat things. Uh, but they don't really use aggression for any other purpose. They do have a defensive bite. If you lay an electric shock on them or one, and one animal bites another, they'll turn around and bite back. So that's an interesting defensive reaction that perhaps one day could evolve into true aggression. So let's see. Uh, we talked about, we've already talked about how simple they are. Um, Minimal sociality, blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. I could talk about this some more. <laughs> so, my point here is that if you don't have aggression, you're not going to be an effective social animal besides some mindless ladybug in a crowd, right? Because what can you do with aggression? 
aggression is the basis of sociality. Let's get towards, towards it later. I'm going to talk about what uh, Keiko Hirayama did in my laboratory. She looked at the animal's nervous system, and what she found was that appetite of state, appetite of state, appetite of state is the probability that at any moment you're going to perform a goal-directed action of any sort. You know, it's if I want to go play, I want to socialize, I want to eat, I want to drink, I need to, I need to take a, the salt shaker and put it down my throat because I'm deprived. The appetite of state. What Keiko found was that appetite of state is manifested, it's expressed in the excitation state of the animal's feeding network corresponding to areas of our hypothalamus, right? Essentially in this, interacting with the midbrain to affect decisions on whether to get up and go out and open the icebox or not. That's what she found. And this is the circuitry, the general nature of the circuitry that she found that uh, expresses uh, decision, approach avoidance decision, avoidance or orienting, based on the appetite of state of the feeding network, which we're calling a homeostatic network here. Uh, this is a, a, the sensory lines, the sensory integrator circuits that are involved, the uh, uh, homeostatic network, which might be uh, activated by appetite of stimuli and cause a reward to go out to uh, learn a, a sensory signature for something that's good or could go out uh, from during an avoidance, an avoidance task to say, well, uh, no, we don't want to eat this animal if we ever find it again. And uh, then we have a, a turning network which uh, essentially can be switched by curly outputs from an avoidance turn to an orienting turn, a network which is by default organized for avoidance. But with input coming in from an excited homeostatic network can switch to approach. Okay? Now, there's a lot of lines in here, but basically this is very simple. This is a very the very simplest sort of thing that you can put together that will make a cost benefit decision. Okay? Why don't we take a break for five minutes? We can drink some water, make some cost-benefit decisions, play Temple Run. So let's see. Oh, this is the nature of this neuronal nature of the switch. It seems to be operating. Uh, uh, so the question is, we've got a, a, a simple model here, and uh, the, uh, one would like to know, does it does it really work, or is this just some jive? And uh, what uh, some very clever students have done, uh, uh, Mariani and uh, Misha and uh, people like uh, Quinn and uh, uh, Nathaniel have uh, put their heads together and come up with a very simple multi-agent model of little animals that are all driven by this little network that I showed you. And uh, uh, their little green dots in the environment that are good to eat, and then there are little red dots that are like the Spanish shawl. And what these animals do is they've got uh, a simple uh, learning mechanism. They go around eating the green dots, say, mm, these are good. They come to a red dot and say, whoa, whoa, this is terrible. They spit it out, and they'll go after red dots unless they get super hungry. And then they'll eat a red dot, okay? And in hundreds, hundreds of pairings of, of pleurobranchia with the Spanish shawl, we have found uh, five or six instances where crazy, really crazy hungry animals will just eat the whole thing, right? This is, this is like you and I after we've had a bad experience at that uh, restaurant in Campus Town. We get sick, but it's the only place open. And uh, <laughs> we go back, we go back, right? Or we, we, we go shovel up that roadkill and fry it. Right? Better than starving. Not much sometimes, but better than starving. So it works out. It seems to uh, uh, reproduce uh, some of the major elements of optimized foraging. Uh, there's, uh, here's a little animal in here that uh, 
is uh, good to eat. It's a Batesian mimic. Do you know what a Batesian mimic is? A Batesian mimic is an animal that mimics a dangerous animal and receives protection from those predators that have learned to avoid the dangerous animal. And uh, this receives protection like that, but every so often, every so often one of these agents will get really hungry and eat it and it say, oh, well that's not so bad. And it increases attempted predation on the little red guys, which is really what happens in nature. We were, we were really interested to see this emerge from the model. So it looks as if uh, what Keiko has, has, has done and uh, Mariani and, and people have, have, they've come up with a really working model for cost-benefit decision. A very simplest model that perhaps, perhaps resembles the core of the cost-benefit decision model that our most ancient ancestors had. Back when we were just little predatory worms coming out of the holes with our new great bronchial apparatus and becoming predators. So perhaps we have, perhaps this simple organization was very similar. So uh, once you have that, once you have that, where can you take it? And uh, the question is, I think the really interesting question is, why don't we do a bottom-up approach? That's preloaded to the interesting question. Why don't we do a bottom-up approach and see, can we get, can we take, what circuitry do we need to add on to this simple model to get increased cognitive ability, increased sociality, since sociality and cognition seem to evolve so closely together. So how do you do that? Uh, well, the first thing to do is sit down with a glass of wine or a beer and a cocktail napkin, right? And a pencil and say, what do you need to be social? What do you need to increase your level of behavioral economics, of cognitive ability? And what you want to do is if we're going to add new circuitry, it has to be something that is plausibly evolved from pre-existing circuitry. Easy enough if we remember the basic rules of the evolution of the brain. You can increase the size of a structure through duplication of neurons. You can decrease it through deletions, inherited deletions. You can change the connectivity. The connectivity in our brains is wildly different from each one of us as individuals to, the, to another, right? It's markedly different. We know that. Well, we look different, we act different, we completely act differently. And if we look at different parts of the brain, they're wired differently. If you look at the biochemistry of the brain from one wild type animal to another, there's marked differences. That's why we like to use isogenic strains of animals in the lab. They give us uh, uh, some control over variability. So evolutionary plausibility, uh, simple, we, we can develop something from uh, 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 pre-existing structures. It's easy enough to imagine the evolution of no, new sensory lines of taking an existing motor network and evolving it, perhaps selecting it to do uh, something slightly different. So, aggression. I've already suggested uh, in agreement with uh, a greater people who have gone before me is the basis of sociality, certainly of uh, sociality beyond the grouping of ladybugs. Uh, what does aggression do for you? It allows you to defend resources. It gives you clear wins and losses within agonistic interactions. Associated with aggression is a real is, is, is uh, usually a mechanism saying that I'm losing this contest, time to get out of here, and I'll come back if only I can get bigger or this guy dies. <laughs> All right, <laughs> something like this. Uh, you can form social hierarchies for partitioning uh, reproductive and uh, nutritional uh, resources. Uh, 
you can defend territories, and you can negotiate. Okay? Does this work for anybody? Does this not work for anybody? Are we, it's too, too late in the day to argue, isn't it? <laughs> my God, will you ever finish? <laughs> this is my favorite instance, though. Uh, aggression promotes territoriality. This is an animal called Lotia gigante. It's a limpet. Do you, who, know, who knows what a limpet is? Limpet. <gasps> A limpet is this really primitive, primitive snail. It's just got a little flat kind of rounded shell. And this lady is living on a rock in the high intertidal. In fact, this is uh, about how high she is off of uh, low tide on a, on a given day. And uh, this is her territory here. And she's very territorial. And if another limpet comes and uh, invades her territory, she'll run over and defend it. She'll try and lift her shell under that limpet and pop it off the rock and it'll fall in the inner tidal and uh, that's otter food within minutes probably and uh, she also knows the extent of her territory she has a home site this might be it right here that she comes back to and stays and sleeps and uh, endures the uh, uh, the next uh, uh, tidal cycle and uh, uh, she she and her neighbors know each other, and they recognize each other, and they, they negotiate the boundaries with aggressive interactions. She takes care of her territory. This is typical of territorial animals. You don't wreck it, because it's, then it's gone, right? They essentially garden. They scrape enough algae off of the rocks to get nutrition, but they leave a layer that can regenerate. Now the opposite of a landless limpet, they'll come into the territory and they've got to be quick because the owner is going to come soon and you're probably going to lose. You don't have much invested in here. Don't, don't spend the effort, but uh, it may be that you might win, but uh, you're probably not going to. They usually run, they usually lose an interaction, and uh, uh, when they come in, they just tear it up as fast as they can. They rasp and rasp right down to the rock to get as much as they can, as fast as they can. They're like pirates, they're pillagers. It's the opposite of being a landholder, right? You're going, arr, arr. <laughs> Tear up the town, open the beer. Uh, and then, then, then the king's men come in and uh, off you go. So this is my favorite, my favorite example. And uh, the use of aggression to establish and defend her territory. Oh, this, this young lady is about 25 years old, which is when they become sexually mature. They start out as males or protandrous, and they uh, go around uh, 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 begging off of the, the, the landed females and uh, uh, perhaps getting a copulation here and there. And then eventually, if they're successful enough to get big enough, then they'll change sex and establish their own territory if they can find it. I used to uh, go around the rocks and pop them off and put them in the campfire and uh, they're, they're, they're better than abalone, they're delicious, until I found out that they were 25 years old. <laughs> That's not a renewable resource. Formation of dominance hierarchies, how do we put that together? Uh, Oh, dominance hierarchies essentially function to reduce conflict within groups, partition trophic, reproductive uh, resources, and they rise through bouts of agonistic interactions that result in a win and a loss. So how do you win? And how do you lose in one of these? You win by not losing. Yes. <laughs> Does that make sense, right? And how do you lose? You lose by realizing that uh, there are diminishing returns, that you're tired, you've incurred damage, and you're better off to get the heck out of there. So this is a decision, right? This is a cost-benefit decision. How do we put that together? This is a nice one I like. Uh, we need aggression for all of these things. If we're going to start for, uh, putting things together for uh, uh, territoriality and uh, 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 social hierarchies, then let's invent aggression. Start off 
with the basic circuitry here. We have a feeding network, that homeostatic network. We have a negative feedback pathway from satiation. Okay? And uh, so the excitation state goes up and down depending on how satisfied the animal is with the resource availability. And it's in a reciprocal inhibitory relationship with avoidance behavior. This is the way, this is the way it usually works, right? Let's invent aggression this way. Let's take that feeding network and do with it what most animals do when they're aggressive. They use their feeding apparatus, their jaws and their claws, okay? And this way, it would be simple enough by jiggling a little circuitry to put this into a mode where it operated in just biting and not swallowing, all right? And Let's leave it coupled. This is an electrical symbol for coupling. Let's leave it coupled to the feeding network. And uh, when it's active though, it, it inhibits active feeding. And uh, what this means is that you can couple the expression of aggression to the animal's valuation of resources. Does that work? Economically, neuroeconomically? And then let's put it into a reciprocal inhibitory relationship with avoidance. So when the animal is aggressing, then uh, it's not feeding, it's not avoiding, but when enough pain comes in through the sensory pad, well, let's put in uh, some, some more lines here, uh, sensory integrative lines uh, for deterrence and incentive, put in some more sensory lines, ignore, ignore most of that, but uh, essentially when enough pain builds up in here, we can bring the expression of avoidance into existence and suppress aggression and get the hell out of there until we feel better, until we heal. Simple enough, simple enough. And it's possible, I think, I think it's possible to take simple circuitry like this and put together a quasi-cognitive computational entity blah, 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 social behavior and mollusks. Um, oh, this, is the, this would be the important thing for evolving in, in soci sociality and uh, cognition is affiliation, right? Making deals. And I think uh, a reasonable way for this to evolve, at least according to the cocktail napkins, is that uh, uh, a parent child, a mother-child relationship, which is so important in so many, many mammals, so important in so many, many mammals, is formed where the parent and offspring bond together. The parent recognizes the offspring, takes care of the offspring, and uh, uh, feeds the offspring, defends the offspring as a resource. Okay, and the offspring can uh, 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 form bonds with her and uh, eventually it grows up and uh, becomes part of the group and, a, and, and an important ally. You could take this bonding mechanism, if you've got it in the first place, uh, uh, it would sit down with the cocktail napkin and see how you can evolve it in the first place. You can take this and uh, generalize it perhaps to other animals. For instance, the father of the child, if the resources are such in the environment that it is to his advantage that he can be selected to join the club and stop, stop walking around in a t-shirt with a can of beer and do some work around the house. So, here's your cocktail napkin mechanisms. Uh, how, did you, how would you evolve an animal to join a group for the advantages? Uh, uh, how would you decide not to eat the kids, which may have been your habit before, and treat them as resources? And uh, uh, a natural basis, if you can do it, for the evolution of cooperative and altruistic partnerships with unrelated individuals. And 
here's a question. How did you like that paper? How did you like that paper we passed out? Did you sit around reading it a lot? <laughs> it was a difficult paper. Just the statistics, understanding the statistics. I'm still not clear, but I, I trust that it probably had some pretty good reviewers who understood the uh, probability uh, distributions very well. And uh, let's, let's go over, uh, this, this is the idea that uh, the major force in the evolution of cognition and sociality was a change to a diurnal habit, right? A diurnal habit, circadian rhythm. And uh, these are the various groups of monkeys from the, uh, the most primitive monkeys, the lemurs and the lorises, which are mainly nocturnal. Some have become, a few have become rather diurnal and uh, uh, have very uh, 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 certain uh, relationships between uh, 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 males and females and, and social groups. They may be solitary, they may form bisexual groups, they may form groups that are mainly dominated by females and the males may go away and be solitary and come back to the groups to mate, much like male elephants, for instance. And uh, then groups that uh, are mainly uh, heterogeneous bisexual groups like chimpanzees who have males and females, they're always fighting and resourcing. There's not a lot of real pair bonding between, between the sexes. Within the sexes there is a lot of pair bonding and, and cooperation and, and alliances uh, made. Um, and, and between uh, uh, mother and offspring that can last for a lifetime. And then their animals, these are the basic, the uh, uh, origin of the primates here spreading into uh, the uh, uh, different groups, the old world and new world monkeys, and then the uh, origin of the uh, hominoidia, the uh, uh, split between the primates and uh, between uh, uh, the uh, chimpanzees and uh, the, the, the three different kinds of chimpanzees, the uh, bonobo, the uh, uh, pantrogloditis, and uh, ourselves, uh, were often thought of as, as the third chimpanzee species. And uh, what these people have done is use Bayesian inference, a, a method by which you look at the previous observations. This is all based on molecular data from mitochondrial, mitochondrial genes, okay? that gives you the uh, taxonomic tree here. And based on these observations, you can go back and look at the distribution and test hypotheses for how the different social setups may have evolved. These are the different kinds of animals that uh, they looked at, the lemurs, very uh, uh, nocturnal, the lorises, uh, mostly very nocturnal, uh, very cute animals, and uh, some of them are very social, many of them are quite solitary. Uh, lovely, lovely animals. Some people keep colonies of them and uh, uh, they just fall in love with them. The, the New World monkeys, like the spider monkeys and the like, the uh, uh, Old World monkeys, uh, uh, this guy kills me. I don't know what the hell he's doing. He's a platyrene with a big, big flat nose, and he's sitting on some dead mangrove plants or something. And he's obviously an alpha male. <laughs> what the hell is he doing? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and the big mandrel there, and these beautiful uh, uh, Chinese golden, golden monkeys. Uh, just. It, it, Look at the intelligence on these faces, except him. <laughs> Look at the intelligence on these faces. And, and then the hominoids who almost, almost come up to the rest of them. <laughs> I like the bonobo here and, and the gibbon. Uh, so uh, this is a maximum clade credibility tree uh, through which they do the posterior distribution analysis with the uh, Bayesian Bayesian uh, statistics, and they examine using these stats and the obvious, the apparent evolution of these social uh, organizations, the likelihood uh, that they evolved one way or another. They have three different models. They have one where you just have simply increasing complexity, where you have a solitary animal, sol animals that live solitarily, that may get together and and loose family groups and, and live within pairs perhaps. 
Uh, you can go to groups that are mainly female with uh, males living separately, and then large groups that are uh, full of multi-male, multi multi-female. Uh, you can have uh, a, a linear, a linear uh, uh, evolution back and forth between these. Another possibility is that you can go from any one condition to any other directly and back. And a separate condition that is mostly supported by the analysis that they did, the reversible jump derived mode. I want you to take this phrase home with you and use it three times and it will forever be yours. And if somebody asks what you're talking about, it's, it's a Bayesian inference methodology. <laughs> the uh, uh, sequence of evolution of these, uh, these uh, social organizations is from solitary animals, most likely to a large unstable grouping, a multi-male, multi-female, that can spin off uh, male groups by themselves that, uh, 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 and it can go back to the uh, original and then uh, come back to pair living family groups. A group of animals that may be paired within and you have family groups, which is much like what we have ourselves. And these have virtually no uh, return path. Of course, they, do, they don't, um, they don't um, take, into, take into account the uh, vagaries of human nature, which uh, obviously there is some small possibility that it could go one way or another when World War III comes, who knows? So they're looking at their reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo derived animals and uh, compare it with the other different models and uh, derive a Bayes factor, which if it's greater than two, is, uh, means that uh, uh, these are really, these other models are out to lunch. And the most likely model, given the constraints that they've applied and uh, the models that they've tested is that which they tell us. Looking with similar techniques at the transitions for the coevolution of social living, they find that if we start with solitary nocturnal animals, which appears to be the root condition that we see so prominent in the lorises and the lemurs, that uh, there's uh, a likelihood that it can go either evolve into solitary animals living diurnally or solitary animals that are nocturnal. And that once you get this situation, then it is very likely that they're going to go into a diurnal social organization. Why? Benefits. Predation. Yes, predation, predation. The bigger the group, the more protection. The bigger the group, the more eyes there are. The more alarm calls there are. The more, the more possibility that you're going to be able to head for a tree or head for a burrow. So the other hypothesis they're looking at is that uh, activity phases, where there we can start with a bisexual sol uh, uh, solitary uh, anim animal, all females and males are solitary, going into uh, sex bias, solitary group, socially bisexual to social uh, sex bias. They don't find a lot of statistical support for this model. Rather, this model supports the whole reason that you're here in this class. That is, that we've got circadian rhythms, we've got uh, particular circadian phase of activity that is important for promoting the evolution of sociality and the associated cognitive abilities that we develop to keep track of our relationships with each other, to, to infer what's going on in our conspecifics minds and take advantage of that.
this is the way they think it goes. And Bob's your uncle. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Thank you. You're very patient listeners. <laughs> and that is, if you want to understand how the brain works, you look at behavior. Okay? If you want to understand how the brain works, you look at behavior and you look at the transitions between the behavioral elements and the conditions under which they occur. And if you do that, you can draw an effective general circuit on your cocktail napkin, just like I did with uh, positive and negative arrows going here and there. And knowing a little bit about neurophysiology, you can put it in a physiological context and you can come up with a model that is testable. And this is the most important thing that you can learn right now. So good night. <laughs>